Hello and welcome to our weekly credit chat that we host every single Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on YouTube and on Twitter. You know, credit chat is a time when we get together to talk about credit and money issues that matter to all of us. And every week we cover a different personal finance topic. And today we're talking about identity theft and ways to protect ourselves from identity theft. I'm excited because we have uh, several guests with us in our video hangout. We have Rod Griffin. He's the director of public education for Experian, and you might see him tweeting uh, with the credit chat hashtag. Uh, his Twitter handle is Rod underscore Griffin. We also have Becky Frost joining us. She's the senior manager of consumer education here at Experian, and you'll see her tweeting at Frostby. That's at F R O S T B E. And my name is Mike Delgado. I'm the senior manager of social here at Experian, and I'll be tweeting at Mike Delgado as well as at Experian underscore US. I want to let you know that there's several ways that you can join us. Uh, you can join us uh, simply on Twitter by using the credit chat hashtag. And if you do a search right now uh, with the credit chat hashtag, you'll be able to see the conversation happening there. So please join us on Twitter uh, if you'd like to ask any questions or post your thoughts to the uh, questions we'll be tweeting out. So please join us there on Twitter. Also, if you'd like to join us in our Google Plus Hangout, uh, if you have a question for our panel, would like to have a leave a comment there. You can do it several. You can interact with us several different ways. Simply click on that little widget on the bottom left-hand side of the screen that says "Be part of the conversation." If you click on that, you'll be brought into a special YouTube app room where you can actually thumbs up content. So as Rod and Becky are speaking, and there's something that you really like, if you thumbs up it, uh, we'll get notified about that, and that's really helpful for us when we develop new content in the future. So please. Uh, thumbs up anything that you like uh, throughout the next hour. Also, if you have uh, questions or comments for Becky or Rod, you can do that in the right-hand side of the YouTube app room. Uh, that's a place where you can actually type in your questions or your comments, so you can do that right there. So now uh, I want to welcome our guests. Hey, Becky, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me today. Really glad you could join us. And Rod, I'm glad we can get you in. Is everything working on your side? Rod, can you hear me okay? Uh-oh, your sound got cut off. <laughs> Having a little bit of issues on our side. Um, oh, Rod, I think you're on mute. I think you're on mute right now. It's the joys of technology, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so um, as we get started, Becky, I wanted to ask you, have you ever been a victim of identity theft at all? You know, identity theft actually affected me at a very young age um, because it happened to my mom. So that's one of the reasons why I'm very passionate about this. My mom was a single mother with two children, and she was affected by identity theft. And unfortunately, the thieves had made off with her bank account information. Oh, and that's actually one of the hardest things to deal with because when you're dealing with a credit card, it's not directly affecting your ability to buy groceries. That's right. Um, but when your bank account information is compromised, you do eventually get to the end of it, but it can have really detrimental effects in the short term. So that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionately committed to teaching people about, yes, identity theft. It's a thing, first of all. So a lot of people don't even know or want to ignore it. Um, and secondly, you can protect yourself, though. And if it happens to you, you can recover. So, sorry, that was probably more than you wanted no, to no, know. No. That's fascinating. I mean, and I think I'm back. Oh, hey, Rod, I can hear you. <laughs> hey, Rod. <laughs> I'll try to stay this time. Yeah. Yeah, Becky, that, okay. that's frightening um, when someone can get access to your bank account. Yes. Yeah, and it, it, it literally affects your ability to buy groceries for your kids. I mean, that, that was my first experience with identity of theft. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, there are things, there are so many different risks these days, right? I mean, from whether it's your bank account, whether it's your credit cards, whether it's someone opening up a new account in your name. And those are just, you know, the more kind of traditional ways of identity thefts. But there are a lot, there's a lot that's going on these days. Yeah. And I'll jump in, too, because I am mm -hmm. a victim right now. So it's oh, you know, the whole issue. We got a, I got a check in the mail for $8,322.15 from Whoa. the IRS. <laughs> and so my tax refund, the problem was I hadn't filed my taxes yet. Oh. So um, so it, it's nice to get a check like that unless you really don't deserve it. Um, <laughs> Whoa. So, so uh, 
we you know I've been going through the whole fraud process and Becky's is absolutely right there are steps you can take sometimes you can't protect yourself I still don't have any idea how it happened I suspect there was a breach somewhere in a ring yeah. of some sort I actually met a couple of other people at a recent conference I was at and they received a check for exactly the same amount through the same banks through the same processors um, with different names so it sounds like it's a, a ring somewhere but I've purposely been going through experience fraud assistance process just like any other person would no you know, haven't talked to anybody internally haven't asked for any special assistance and I can tell you it's it's straightforward it's, it's fairly simple quite simple and my wife's been doing the same thing and I haven't been giving her any hints either I just said go to Experian.com and so we've added alerts we've done all of those things and uh, it's an interesting experience, but um, and, and it's primarily just makes you angry. Yeah, that, that someone would do that. Yeah, you know that feeling of victimization yeah. really, really hits home. A lot of people that we've talked to who've gone through identity theft, they liken it to a mugging. You know, mm -hmm. they feel like, and what's so unfortunate is that you don't know. You know, when you don't know who's who's. Come, come at you. You know, it's right. it's hard to identify, and it's even harder to catch them. Um, and and you're left trying to just fix the situation. Becky, one one of my friends, he had his his ATM card got you know scanned or something, and mm -hmm. someone ended up draining his entire bank account, his checking Ugh, account. Yeah, yeah. Because his ATM card he used at a restaurant. Yeah, you know, and that that's also a common way. So it seems like we're talking about how does identity theft happen? And and these days I think that people think, okay, that thieves are always evolving. And it's true. Identity theft is a crime of opportunity. Um, but that doesn't mean that when there's a new method that's introduced to commit it, that that old method goes away. It just keeps on growing, which is probably why it's the leading um it's the leading crime reported to the FTC year over year for 15 years in a row. Um, so yeah, your friend was a victim of skimming. That can happen at restaurants. That can happen at fuel pumps. Um, so I guess for everyone that's listening, you know, it's really important to realize one that identity theft can happen anywhere, and that to keep your guard up. You know, even at, if you're at a restaurant, or even if you go to a fuel pump, or even an ATM, where if it's something, and these days it, it's they can look tampered with, um, but they also, they, the, the crimes and the skimmers are so seamless that mm. it's not always easy to tell. So that's why it's really important, one, if it looks like it's been tampered with, the gas pump or the uh, ATM, don't use it, alert management. And two, if it, um, if monitor your statements, right? Because you, it's so important that if you see anything out of the ordinary, you know, I go on my bank account several times a day just to look and, and make sure, and there have been things that I've caught. Um, so monitor your bank statements, especially, and don't ignore small hits to your bank account. Um, you know, the thief will often test out, or your credit account, the thief will often test out um, the account with a small amount before moving on to selling that information or making that large hit. So it's really important to keep your eyes open and stay vigilant. Thanks, Becky. I'm just looking at a tweet. Uh, Stop Fraud Colorado just tweeted out about some common ways identity theft happens. They're saying data breaches, dumpster diving, phishing, mail fraud, and more. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the dumpster diving? Because that's something I have not really thought about for identity theft. Oh, yeah. Um, dumpster diving is actually a very common way for identity theft to occur. Um, we, and actually, we... We worked with, we've worked with in the past the Identity Theft Resource Center, and they shared stories with us where there are identity theft rings. I mean, this is a business, right? This isn't just someone, although an identity thief might be an individual sitting at home at their computer, this is also a serious business to many people. So they treat it like a business, and they employ people to go out and to pull all the papers from dumpsters or we We'd heard um, the stories of people who had, at a small dental office, left the boxes of past patient records, not redacted, not even with wow. a Sharpie crossing anything out, wow. in the back of their alley because they were expecting a shredder to come and drive up and, and shred it on site, but they hadn't kept it in their office. Long story short, those boxes were stolen. Um, we often hear of storage units getting broken into uh, that are abandoned, that are broken into by police or by the, the storage unit company, and they're just filled with boxes, and it looks like trash, but really what it is is paperwork from dumpster diving. 
and they'll go through that at their leisure, take out the sensitive information and either use it themselves or sell it online on the dark web where they can sell social security numbers, bank account information, anything that they can make money on they'll sell. Um, I jump in there too. I worked with a law enforcement officer in Washington State a few years ago and they had issues with methamphetamine rings and addicts who would get trash, shredded trash that was strip shredded instead of cross cut. Yeah, mm -hmm. and apparently, maybe it's the uh, could, I don't know if a benefit is the right word for methamphetamine use, but it gives them long waking hours and extreme concentration, and they would tape together documents to steal the identities from them that they'd Whoa. taken out of the trash cans, uh, and then use that identity to you know, the card numbers and the kinds of things they found to to steal and and then fund their habit. Mm. So. Right. Really, really kind of crazy, scary thing to think about. Exactly. I'm just taking a look here at some of the conversation happening in our tweet chat, and Wayne Chan just tweeted out about identity theft could happen in all sorts of ways. He said one major way is phishing in this digital age. That's P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. Becky, can you talk a little bit about phishing and how phishing is, what is phishing and how is that used to steal identities? Sure, and it's actually very topical right now because one of the major phishing scams that's going on and that goes on, especially this time of year, is a tax phishing scam. And this is used by multiple identity thieves. Um, so you want to be sure, a phishing scam in general, and the identity thieves are phishing for your information. But how they want to get it is by actually letting you open access to your information. So that usually comes from an email, whether it looks like it's from the IRS, and by the way, the IRS will never email you. Whether it looks like it's from the IRS, whether it looks like it's from your bank. If you get an unsolicited email from uh, a, some type of like credit card provider, financial services provider, or even the IRS, you always want to think twice about those. These emails are written in a way that are designed to get you off your guard. So it's either something saying that, like in the case of the IRS, that they have either a large refund to give you and to click on this link and enter, send them all your personal information. Mm -hmm. With banks, they're very commonly saying, we, we're upgrading our systems and we need your information so that we can keep uh, providing services to you. You know, there's always a little bit of a, a threat, whether it's a minor threat like that, or even the phone phishing scams don't necessarily qualify as phishing uh, in the technical sense, but that's exactly what they are, where you get a phone call from someone who purports to be from the IRS and says that they have a warrant for your arrest. Well, wow. first of all, the IRS wouldn't arrest you themselves, right? But it's all designed to get you off your guard because that's when people, that's when smart people are still able to fall victim to, to scams. And, and, you know, you immediately, you react. So you click on the link or you immediately want to give the answer. I got a phone call this year and I, the adrenaline was running mm. and then I, I and, and I, I do this every day for a living and talk about identity theft and I had to stop and think to myself, no, this is a scam, you know, and, and obviously not engage or respond to uh, the person on the other end of the line. And, and what phishing does is if you do click on the link, either malware is installed and they um, track, there's keystroke logging, so they track when you log into everything, or the other phishing scam is when they ask for information, you just send it to them. Hmm. Yeah, social engineering is the technical term, I guess, for, for phishing and for the, the telephone scams, and we're all susceptible you know, to, to the same emotional responses, and I think they, they capitalize on that. Yeah. Just saw a tweet from the Jumpstart Coalition. Uh, they're saying, with kids, sometimes the thief is a family member who borrows the identity, not realizing the potential harm. Have you heard stories about that, Becky or Rod, about this identity theft happening from family members stealing other people's identities? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead, Rod, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we... You know, I write the Ask Experian column, and when we and we get emails and have you know, fairly often from from people saying that you know their family members, friends, you know, people they've known have stolen their identities. It's not, you know, it's you know, it's it's not uncommon for that to be mm. part of the issue. Um, you know, there was a time where you know there were certain 
cultures actually where there were younger children and grandchildren taking advantage of uh, their grandparents who primarily were new immigrants. Yeah. Uh, so we, we saw those issues as well. Um, but it, it does happen. Foster children are another example. Yeah, that's, that one's with. really unfortunate that's and makes huge. me so frustrated because yeah. the amount of foster children who've had their identities compromised and stolen, it's just, it's higher. They're, they're, they're more likely to have it happen to them than other children their age. Yeah. And that's that's just unfortunate. Um, yeah. And a lot of times it's important to emphasize here that when it happens between family members, um, the family member sometimes thinks they're doing a good thing. Um, I was talking with one of our Protect My D members. She was 18 years old. And she her aunt opened up accounts in her name. And, and she'd come across this girl's social security number at her sister's house. Mm -hmm. And she was going through a divorce at the time and was having issues with her credit. And so she viewed it as a fresh start, and she also viewed it as almost like a gift to her niece that she would s establish credit in her niece's name, and then when her niece needed to use credit, she'd already have established credit. Well, you know how the story goes. That didn't happen. She had continual credit issues, and, and she'd also viewed these new lines of credit um, almost as... Uh, an extra source of income, if you will, and had no way to pay it back. Oh. So when this girl went to apply for college loans, she was denied. And then she not only had to deal with the fallout from that, but then also the family fallout and the awkwardness. And the aunt, her initial intentions weren't bad, but that didn't change the fact that identity theft is a crime. Yeah. Becky, what are some ways, uh, or I guess some signs to know that you're a victim of identity theft? Like, how are, how are you monitoring your, you know, your identity personally to keep track of what's going on? Well, I, I do work for Experian, so I do use Experian's Protect My ID. Um, and, and I do highly recommend having, in all seriousness, I do recommend having an identity monitoring product uh, like Protect My ID that monitors your credit report on a daily basis. It also performs internet scan, so looking again for the, at the dark web for sale of your social security number or your bank account information, and then just getting the alerts. We do a lot of other monitoring, but then getting those alerts so that if anything happens, I then can call and talk to an identity theft resolution agent. So, you know, that's my, if, if people are able to and, and interested in identity monitoring, I highly recommend Protect My ID. Um, but simply awareness is key. I mean, we have to back it up and realize that most people are affected by the I don't think it will happen to me syndrome when it comes to identity theft. Uh, and, and you really have to, one, be aware of it before you can fight it. Yeah. I, and Beck, you made it, and uh, just made a really good point, and particularly about Protect My ID, and and the fact that it doesn't just monitor your credit report. The you know, my instance, for example, had nothing to do with my credit history, and mm -hmm. so you know, with it, people have the credit report is very important as part of you know the identity theft, I, discovering it and recovering from fraud and helping protect against fraud. But it's not everything, and people, I think, often have the impression that if I add a fraud alert or I freeze my credit file, I don't have to worry about being a victim anymore, and right, that's no. simply not true. Um, you know, there's, it, it, it's important, but it's not everything. You know, credit fraud is a symptom of identity theft. It's not identity theft. And right. You know, and identity the theft is a war. Yeah, identity theft is a war on multiple fronts. So yeah. just doing one thing, that's why if someone says, well, you can completely prevent identity theft, usually the answer that they give is not broad enough, and it's not taking into account all of the different risks. Well, and you, know, you look at, at the um, FTC uh, fraud sentinel report mm -hmm. and, identity, and the the top complaint and for a couple of years running now has been government documents fraud resulting from identity theft which again often has nothing to do with a credit report you know it's mm -hmm. like my tax situation so uh, you know it's something to be very aware of Right. An account takeover can happen so easily as well. That's one that we see where some people don't think of that as identity theft. But these days, um, again, social engineering, uh, people are able to go into, especially if your social media profiles are public, um, just 
and if you elect to do that purposefully, that's fine, but then make sure that if you're posting images of your cat and including your cat's name or where you went to elementary school or your first car, you know, these are often security questions that are used with some of our most sensitive accounts like credit and bank account. So if a thief is trying to get into your account not through um, you know, other means of identity theft, but they're trying to access your account by answering those, uh, those security questions, you want to make it hard for them. So just be sure that if you're using, you know, if Fluffy is your is your password, that's fine. Just don't post picture of Fluffy on social media. <laughs> and say this is Fluffy, yeah. 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 Uh, Becky, I'm looking at the infographic that uh, we just tweeted out about for, coming from the 2014 PMID Cybersecurity Survey mm -hmm. about some of the startling findings and misconceptions about identity theft. Can you talk a little bit about this recent survey, what you guys discovered? Sure. So every year during National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we, we perform um, or we commission a survey. And what's interesting is that we are seeing awareness of identity theft um, growing over the years. We've done this for five years. So we've seen the awareness of identity theft grow, but people still feel like they ha they're vulnerable. And a lot of times we saw more than most last year, people felt they knew more about identity theft because the, of data breaches that had been in the news. Um, and then they also were, felt more vulnerable to identity theft, again, probably because uh, one of those factors could have been the breaches and then other things as well. So while it's good that people are aware of the risk, they still don't have um, a lot of understanding of how can I protect myself. And there are things that you can do on your own to protect yourself. There are things that you know, companies like Experian can do for you as well with the daily monitoring and the alerts and having the fraud resolution agent. So it's you know finding the combination that works for you, but at, at least taking steps to protect yourself. And again, always keep having your guard up. That's really important. Did that answer your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, it did. Thank you, thank you, Becky. No, it's <laughs> it's good and. Um, Right now, we just tweeted out question number three, which is, how can we do a better job of, protect, of protecting our personal information? Rod, do you want to take this Yeah, one? I was just saying, I think, Becky, you, you just covered a lot of it. It's awareness, number one. You, you have to think about what you're doing. Um, and it's a lot of simple things, you know, don't leave documents sitting on your desk or your kitchen table or your kitchen counter that have identifying information on it if you're having guests over or you know people working in your house that sort of thing don't respond to unsolicited emails shred everything shredders yeah. are cheap hmm. buy a shredder I mean that's one of the, the easiest things to do one of the best investments that if, if, if I get anything in the mail you know, I shred it before it goes into the trash. I don't care what it is. If it, you know, if it has a bank name on it, if it has my name on it, if it has an address, it goes in the shredder. Yes. There's no reason not to just do that reflexively. Um, you know, uh, it, be aware. It, exactly that awareness, and also sometimes things don't get shredded because, at least in my household. Um, because of convenience, right? The shredder is in yeah. a different location. So what I do is we kind of have two places where we review our mail in our house, and the shredder is in one of those places. So there are also the identity blocker stamps that you can get at office supply stores. Um, that if it's just something like a simple postcard junk mail that was sent to me, um, I will identity block stamp that card and then throw, you know, then tear it up and throw it out. But shredding is so essential. Like I said, it's we have digital and physical identity footprints and it's so important to cover yourself on both fronts. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, you have to think about, okay, I'm not going to use public Wi-Fi to do banking, but you also, you can't, that doesn't mean that you don't shred things anymore. It means you now do both. Yeah. I love this tweet by Bahia. I want to put this up. She says, uh, protect yourself by changing your passwords every 30 days and do not repeat passwords from before. Yes, that's and again, I would also say don't use Fluffy as a password. <laughs> or your mother's maiden name, um, yeah. you know, all those sorts of things that are, are pretty easy to to find. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge with the changing your password for me is that I can't remember them. <laughs> and so you know, you know. <laughs> so I, know. I so I have a safe. So. <laughs> Good. 
you know, you always, you know, those kinds. Of, if you and that's the other thing. Don't write down your passwords on a piece of paper and set, set them under your keyboard. Mm -hmm. Not a good place for your password. Yeah. Um, or or your pin numbers on post-its in your wallet. I'm just saying. Yeah. But know. you know, actually, Rod, I was on a radio show recently talking about passwords, and um, the host actually did one better because I I talked about how I change my regularly, and I actually have a safe where I keep a reference of them. And yeah. she said that she doesn't even do that. She needs to write them down as well. She doesn't. Some people use apps to store their passwords. You know, you need to make sure that app is secure before you do it. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, instead of writing down your passwords, um, write a hint that's going to help you remember that password. Mm. And that's what you store. So even if your cheat sheet was found, if it wasn't you, the thief couldn't do anything with it. Yeah. I thought that was pretty good. If I can remember what my hints mean. <laughs> I don't get hints, so I'd be going, oh, what I meant by that. <laughs> so, think harder about that. Yeah. But, uh, oh, dear. And there's so yeah. many there's so many websites, so many different accounts that we have, you know, usernames and passwords for. It gets crazy. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's sort of a symptom of our life, I think, today, and the fact that we're so interconnected on everything. Um, but it's also, I think, a reality that we have to adapt to. Yeah. yeah, and that's the the thing we have to understand is that identity thieves are very creative, mm -hmm. and we have to try to think like them. Which you know, it's it that's hard to do. You know, yeah. I I've started telling people I was filing a police report with with my copy of the voided IRS check for eight thousand dollars, and and I was sitting with the officer, and I said, after we asked some questions, I said, you know, if I had thought like a thief, I would have deposited this. And then when I file my taxes, I could have paid them with it, but <laughs> to send it back. But I don't think like a thief, so it didn't occur to me until it was Good too late. Good for you for taking that moral high ground, Rod. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I would have anyway. <laughs> but, oh, dear. But, you know, it's so true, like, think like a thief. So we do a lot of living online these days, and it's important. Actually, I was talking with um, a law enforcement member, and when he does his shopping online, he thinks like a thief and thinks this card will eventually get stolen. So he has a dedicated card that he uses for all of his online shopping, and he really only shops at trusted sites. His reasoning is, one, he could still, a thief could still get him, and that's why he has the one card that he uses. He, he calls it his um, like vulnerability card. So that's the card that he knows that he monitors more, and, uh, well, and, and that, that way it's not like if identity theft happened, it would happen to all four of his credit card accounts. Mm -hmm. it, it would happen to that one. So that's that was also a good tip from a law enforcement member. Of, if you do any shopping online, be consistent about the credit card you use and really try to avoid using a debit card if you can online because, again, it ties back to my mom's story of if identity theft hits your bank account, it directly impacts you. Yeah. And you also mentioned something else that's important, and that's to always work with trusted websites. Yeah. Um, you know, I my family knows that I will use them as examples. So... <laughs> My daughters, a couple of years ago for for Christmas, were buying each other coach purchase, purses. And so I know all about coach purses now. <laughs> but they found a website and they were really cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, really sure. Purchases. Yeah. yeah. And it looks too good to be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they were really good copies, but they weren't real. Uh, you know, right. and so it's, you know, so, you know, there, there are things that should set off alarm bells. Mm -hmm. And, and watch for them. You know, you have to be diligent. You have to be thoughtful. And mm -hmm. that's it's easy to slip, you know, and go the easy route. So Well, and identity thieves again, they're smart and it's a crime of opportunity. So they they design things whether it's something bad like the threat of arrest or something great like this amazing deal on a designer bag. It's designed to just get you to react. So if yeah. you find yourself reacting, it, it's Thinking about it ahead of time means that when you're starting to react, you're going to stop and pause and think, is this too good to be true, or is this even possible? I'm going to stop and not give this information away. Yeah. Yeah, I think about all those different, like, online coupon sites or discounting forums where people are sharing links, and you don't necessarily know where those links are going. 
Right. Well, and it's so important because so many businesses do have on, a, a strong online presence, right? Yeah. So it's important to not say that or, or to realize that some of those sites are going to be valid, but then just realize that anything that's taken off online, whether it's online couponing, online retailing, whatever it is, that thieves see that as well, and they're going to try and take advantage of that. So whether it's an online retail site or an online coupon site, if it's not a trusted site, that's a red flag. If it's not a site that you see good reviews of, or any reviews of, if it has, again, no digital footprint, that's a red flag. Unless it's brand new and they just launched it and you see a press release that day. you know. But other than that, really use caution. Yeah. And you know, along those same lines, you know, I always say watch for the S, the HTTPS, yes, which helps. But also check the spelling. And there are mm -hmm. spoof sites that will be one letter mm -hmm. off or one character off, and it's easy to miss. And and the sites look exactly like the legitimate business. And so, it you can find yourself trapped and not have any idea why because they changed one letter in in the URL. So yeah, you have to watch it very that, closely. That is, is so That's true, especially like when you see those emails and you see the hyperlink there, which looks legitimate, and and the URL you see in the email could be legitimate, but it's linking somewhere else, and and that could be a problem. I remember I got I got recently um, notified by I got a I got a phone call that there was some unusual activity on my credit card, and I was freaked out about calling the number back. Because I was like, well, what number is this? So I called mm -hmm. up the number on my credit card yeah. and then get routed. Because I was like, I don't know what number just called me. I right. Know, exactly you know, right. It could have been. It could have been a you know, uh, an ID theft ring that called me up and said that I have mm -hmm. a problem with my credit card and called them right away. Mhm. Mm yeah, it's important. That that's a great precaution to take. I I got a call last week about a deal on a magazine and. Um, they want to, it, it sounded great, and I, I happen to love this particular magazine. And so, um, so we got to the point where they wanted to take my information, and I said, you know what, what, what company is this again? Give me the name, and I will call you back. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that probably was a very viable and real company, but it's just in this day and age, there it was no inconvenience to me to just take a quick moment. I didn't ask them for the number. <laughs> you know, I'm not yeah. going to ask a potential thief to give me the, their <laughs> number. That but, happens a lot, though. It does. Yeah. It does. You know, you think, oh yeah, they gave me the number, so I called them back and I verified. And you're like, wait, who, who? Look, look at the source. Where are you getting your information? So I verified the information, called back, and got a great discount. But you know, it's important to protect yourself these days. Becky, you know, we yeah. store so much information on our mobile devices, and you know, we have our financial apps on our mobile device. We have, we you know so many things um, there. Could you talk about some ways we could protect ourselves with our phones? Sure, yeah, it's really important. You, if you think about your phone, it's like a directory of your life. Um, and if that were lost or stolen, uh, that, that would just be, you know, especially if it didn't have one. We talked about passwords today, so password protect your mobile device. It, it may take a second for you to get into your mobile device every time you access it, whether with your password or with your fingerprint, um, but password protect that device um, because it, you know that second can save you hours in recovering from identity theft. Um, I actually recently lost my mobile device in a foreign country and um, you know took freaked out for like two minutes <laughs> and, and then was able to mobily wipe my phone. I had the ability to mobily wipe my phone and then because um, I couldn't it the, the find my phone feature it was I left it in a, a cab um, in a, a foreign country where it wasn't possible to get it back once that cab had driven away so I was able to find my phone and see it going all around this large city but I wasn't I wouldn't be able to get it back uh, so I was able to mobily wipe all of the information because I do have bank account apps I do have apps to my credit monitoring and identity monitoring products there so I don't want to I don't want anyone having access to that if they were to guess my password um, so you know have a password be able to mobily wipe your phone and have a plan because I had already made this plan like years ago when I got my first mobile phone or smartphone where I could password protect it I said if I ever lose this I'm gonna try and find it I'm going to be able to wipe it and then I'm, if I can't find it and I've wiped it, I'm going to shut it down immediately. And so, I, like I said, I freaked out for two minutes, and then I just worked my plan. 
um, and I have a new phone and everything's fine and I'm not having to deal with identity theft. But if you think about everything that's on your phone, also your apps, password protect your apps, um, even your social media apps. You want to password protect those and log in and log out. Our, I mentioned our survey earlier. The majority of people, more than 50% of people, don't log out of their apps when they're done. And I know it takes a minute, but like I said, you want to log in, log, log out of those apps so that you're getting the, a secure connection and making sure that you're not leaving it open for a potential thief. We're tweeting out question number four, which is, how does medical identity theft happen, and how do we know if we're victims? This is something that's new to me. I'd never really heard about med medical identity theft. Becky, you know, you most, most people, yeah, most people haven't, Mike. And when they do hear about it, it's actually through a collection notice, um, it, because they aren't. You know, oftentimes we get what's called explanation of benefits, where your insurer will send you a very thick envelope with information about yeah. a doctor's visit. A lot of people don't even open those up. Um, so one, you want to open up explanation of benefits, and if it's something that you see that you didn't, you haven't visited that doctor. Um, or have that service, you need to contact your insurance provider immediately. Um, and two, you know, but that that's like a change that most people will need to make is start opening those EOBs, those explanation of benefits. Uh, but the first thing you need to do is if you get a collection, because a lot of times with medical collections, they're for crazy, insane amounts of money. So it's higher amounts of money because someone's had some sort of procedure in your name. Um, and so it's a lot of people just ignore them actually because they're like this is wrong, this isn't me, they'll get it sorted out, I'm not even going to call. You need to call and engage with them and, and Rod, maybe you'll, some people might be afraid to engage with a collections agency so maybe you have some tips on uh, on doing that. Yeah, it's, you know, I hear from people who you know say well if I call a collection agency it will, even if it's not a fraud related issue, it's going to somehow affect the credit report, cause it to remain longer, be re-reported, all of these sorts of things. And none of that will happen. So if you get that information, you, you shouldn't worry about your credit report. Number one, get your report. If you've got a collection notice, there's a strong likelihood that it, the account will be reported to the credit reporting company and will be on the report. You're going to want to report that to us as fraudulent. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so you'll need to look at that report. We can help you contact, you know, give you the contact information in most cases for the collection agency so you can call them and talk to them about what, what's happening, dispute that information is fraudulent, and, yeah. and make sure we get it get it resolved and we'll help you get it resolved. Uh, it, you know, and so it's very important that you work with the source of the, wherever the information is coming from. Right. Uh, because they want to know too. They don't, they don't want to be... Yeah, and they want to know, and you should. You want to know what changes if it's if it's a medical service that's taken place. You know, it it, it could actually affect your life. It could mm -hmm. be life changing. Um, so you want to make sure that you work with your insurer or work with your doctor's office to make sure that the information reverts back to your medical file. I've heard of people who've had anything from conditions added that would have like someone was added on their medical file as diabetic, and they were about to give this person yeah. insulin, and they were not diabetic. Uh, another condition where a blood type was changed. I mean, that could be deadly. So you really need to not only you know deal with the both the financial ramifications of medical identity theft, but the medical piece of it as well. Really making sure that your medical records are your own. Yeah. I want to remind everybody that we are having this credit chat happening right now on Twitter. If you have any questions or comments for Rod or Becky, uh, please join us on Twitter with a credit chat hashtag. A lot of great conversation, a lot of good tips being shared there. So I just want to let you know that you can do that there on Twitter. If you prefer to leave a comment or question for Rod or Becky here in this YouTube chat room, simply click on the bottom link on the left-hand side that says be part of the conversation. If you click on that link, you'll be brought into the special YouTube chat room where you can go ahead and type in your questions uh, or comments for Rod and Becky. Um, mm -hmm. I'm right now looking at the stream, guys, and Becky, you're talking about identity theft happening to children. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that is new to me as well, that mm -hmm. kids' identities are being stolen. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on there? Sure. I mean, w a child identity theft, we've, we talked about it a little bit before, where you know it can be a family member who fell in hard times or yeah. just needed what they think of normally as a fresh start. Um, it could be someone... You know, 
in a divorce situation, uh, you know, taking a child's identity, or it could be your child's information was lost, like say it was at that dental office I referred to earlier, where their records were on that dental office. Yeah. Most people don't know. I'm getting ahead of myself. One, child identity theft is a real threat. Uh, to your children because they are assigned a social security number at birth for tax purposes uh, but that means that there's 18 years of risk there um, that we used to not have but for tax purposes we need it so that's fine um, you just want to protect it so one make sure you keep that social security card in a secure location and two be very very selective on who you share it with a lot of people don't know a lot of parents don't know that it's not required at the doctor's office because it's on the form you know, so you, right. you know, make sure to ask your doctor, but a lot of more current forms I'm seeing when they say have social security number, it says optional. Um, and, and indeed it is optional. Um, the Social Security Administration at SSA.gov uh, has a list of uh, real situations where your social security card would be required. Normally that's with employment um, or working with a government agency. Um, however, a lot of people that ask for your social security number to be used as an identifier, um, you have every right to ask to not supply it and to ask that an alternative identifier be used, especially when it comes to your kids. So you know, keep that card safe and secure, and then, again, don't ignore the warning signs. If your six-year-old starts getting mortgage statements in the mail, mm. don't throw those away. Mm. You know, you, wanna, you want to act quickly. Um, and then I know that on, there's also a misconception, and I actually want to hear Rod's point of view on this because I, I think that he's got a great one about um, a lot of times people think, well, I'll just check my child's credit report. And, and Rod, what's wrong with that? Well, what I tell people is, and what, with the question I get is, you know, it, from some parent, new parents in particular, is I just got my child's social security number. I want to get a copy of their new credit report too, and you know the child's six weeks old, eight weeks old, a couple of months old, <laughs> telling me you they should not have a credit report yet. You right. don't have a credit <laughs> report until there's credit in your name. So if your your child has credit in their name, mm. it's one of two things. It's either you've added them as a, a an, typically an authorized user or a joint account holder on an account or they're a victim of fraud. Mm -hmm. So you know it, it's possible for a minor to have a credit report legitimately. So it shouldn't necessarily be an immediate cause for concern, but at the same time, it, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask and, and to make sure that everything's okay. If, and there's a form on our website you can request a copy of your child's credit report if we have one. If we do, we will provide that. If you provide us with documentation, same issue. Mm -hmm. You have to mail it. We're not going to send a report to somebody because they say it's my child and I want their report. We have no idea whether that's the legitimate parent or guardian or an identity thief. So we require that you send us documentation verifying the child is your child and that you have legal authority to review a report. If we have a report, we'll send it. If not, we'll just send you a statement that there's no record on file, which is really the ideal situation. It means your child's identity hasn't been used to commit credit fraud so uh, you know that should give you some peace of mind um, but you, your child shouldn't get a credit report when they get their social security number uh, although I do get asked that you know, so, so it's, it's kind of yeah. interesting to me. Rod do you think that if a child you know let's just say that they get older and, and a parent adds them to their credit card account to help them kind of build up their credit mm -hmm. do you think it's a good idea for a parent to freeze their child's credit report to prevent any sort of fraud from happening? No, I mean, you know, I th people kind of default to freezing their credit file in all situations now, and I don't think that's the right answer for everyone. Freezing a file is an extreme situation. There are, in terms of, particularly in terms of child identity theft or child, children and credit. Uh, you know, I'm also ask, should I create a credit report to freeze it? And that, to me, seems like a contrary concept. Why would you create something only to then freeze it? If there's no file, you know, no credit history, what mm -hmm. will happen is the lender will get a notice that there's no record on file for that identity, which should tell them there's something going on here. Right. Um, you know, it should help them stop it. If they're using a birth date and we verify it, we'll send a notice saying the birth date you used or the social security number you used is not issued or would belong to a minor which should stop the stop the fraud at that point so freezing the file wouldn't help if your child's a victim of fraud absolutely 
I think it makes sense to freeze the file. And we can you can do that at no cost. Um, to freeze the credit report. I say file, credit report, credit history, credit file, all the same thing. So I'll, I kind of toss them around. But um, you know, doing it simply to to protect the child because you know they've you've opened an account in their name. Probably not. Monitor it. You know, check it. There are monitoring services that let you monitor your child's report just like your own. And you know, we recommend for parents who are really very concerned, that may be you know the right tool for them as well. Like a FAMZU just tweeted out that the FTC has a really good resource um, dealing with child identity theft. So there's that. Uh, I put the link up there on the screen for those that are interested in, in reading what the FTC has to say. We are now uh, tweeting out question number six, guys, which is how can checking credit reports regularly help us Identity, I'm sorry, identify identity theft. Got two identifies in there. <laughs> <laughs> Rod, um, how can uh, checking re credit reports regularly help us with this? Well, it, the, you're going to see one of two things uh, if you're a victim of identity theft, probably both, maybe two or three things. You'll see identity information you don't recognize, so it could be a social security number that's not yours, names, addresses, those sorts of things and possibly accounts that aren't yours. Right. So you look for, if you're monitoring your credit report, watching it, or subscribing to something like Protect My ID, you're going to get a notice when something comes to the report, lets you look at it, and you'll see right away, that's not my account, or I've never used that name, or that social security is not mine. Any one of those things could tip you off that you, you're potentially a victim of fraud and help you react right away. And, and you know, I saw a tweet, somebody said, the key is reacting rapidly, and that's true. You know, once you get the report, see the report, you can take action right away, and that helps stop the activity and protect you from ongoing fraud. So, mm -hmm. look for identity issues, look for account issues, and look for the combinations. Uh, any one thing may not be sufficient to indicate you're a victim of fraud, but combinations of things certainly could be. Exactly, and it's it's so important to, again, I'm, I'll mention Protect My ID because it's so important if you have, and this is for members, but also for Experian has a wealth of information for everyone on our sites, um, and on the on its Protect My ID site, we have a blog where we update regularly about scams. There are many articles, and this is for members and non-members. So, well, you if you're not a member, you won't have a dedicated fraud resolution agent, you know, walking you through the process and and handling some things for you. But you can you can read about the process and you can read about scams. So. So you know, while you may not have identity monitoring happen for you every day and those alerts coming into your phone or your email, you are at least more knowledgeable about scams that are occurring and more knowledgeable about ways to protect yourself. So that's that's really important and that's a great resource that's at blog.protectmyd.com or you can find the blog from the main page of protectmyd.com. And, and I would say the same thing for Ask Experian. We work together, Becky and I, and on yes, a lot yeah, of Yeah, sorry, Rob, yes. So <laughs> we plug each other's I love that work. site, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I, with the Ask Experian column, we talked about just about every issue that we've touched on today at some point. And it's a great source. You know, just type in fraud or identity theft, and you're going to get a number of responses to people who've asked about those issues and ex ex you know, expressly what they should do or how you respond. One of the things, and just sort of a an additional thing to know about credit reports is that the identifying information, we list all of your social security numbers that are reported to us by your lenders and other sources. We list all of the name variations. You know, I have people say you should only have my family again, my dad, we have this conversation about every year when he gets his report because he can't decide what his name should be when he applies for credit. So there are multiple <laughs> names on his credit report. He says you should only have the right one. Well, we're going to list all of them. That's not an error. Uh, same thing's true for social security number variations, address variations. We list all of them so that you have a complete record of what lenders and other sources are saying belong to you so that if there is an indicator of fraud, you can act on it. Uh, and as I said, in most cases, you know, if there's a typo, it's it's not something you should be too concerned about. If it's a nickname you've used to apply for credit, probably not an indicator of fraud. If there's a transposition in a social security number and you otherwise recognize the number, 
in isolation, those things probably aren't something to worry about. But if you see a name with a social that doesn't belong to you and an address you've never seen and then an account, you should really take action right away. Um, you know, so it's that combination, like I said, it's a combination of things you should look for. Becky, I want to ask you something. Um, I've never been a victim of identity theft, but I'm just imagining if one day I do pull my credit report and I do see some accounts that aren't mine and I start freaking out, what should I be thinking about? What, what advice would you have for me in that moment where I'm just emotionally panicked? Right, and you know the first thing you've, you've hit on the, the point there is when we first find out identity theft has happened to us, um, I've never met anyone who didn't panic. So one, take a deep breath, uh, get something to write with, and, and go to work. And like when I lost my phone, I had my moments of panic, but because I had had a plan in place of how I would respond, that took over very quickly, and I was able to mitigate my risks and get the situation taken care of. Well, identity theft is just like, uh, responding to identity theft can be as easy as responding how I responded to losing my phone. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is when you respond, if you have a plan in place, it can make it so much simpler. Um, you want to respond quickly. You don't ignore it, especially if you're getting red flags like collection notices, if your accounts have been either maxed out on the credit side or drained on the bank side, um, if you've seen uh, strange things going on um, while you're looking at your statements online. You know, Respond quickly. Um, one tip that I'll give everyone is that if you know that frauds happen to you um, and you're calling your financial institutions, you know, when we've had something bad happen to us, we're humans, we're uh, communal people, we, we want to talk about it with other people. You'll save yourself a lot of time with, when you first call in, if you were asked, say, I've had, I'm a card member, um, I've had fraud happen, I need to speak with someone in the fraud department. That way you won't have to repeat your story multiple times, you know, using a lot of time and energy, because you've got other calls to make. Mm. Um, another tip that I give is file an identity theft police report if you've had fraud happen to you. Um, that's really something I didn't know before I started working here five years ago, and I'd worked in security for a decade. Um, but that it's important to file an identity theft police report that gives your financial institutions a time frame of of when it was reported and when the suspected the the initial event occurred. Um, so that's something that a lot of people don't know as well. Um, and then have a partner. Uh, just as you have a partner in monitoring and protecting your identity, if you get alerted to the fact that identity theft has happened or you, you confirm that it has happened, have a partner in that resolution process. And our agents are there for our members at Protect My ID to walk you through the steps, you know, and, and help make those calls with you, even get on the phone with you, save you time on the phone. We'd make the calls for you if we could, but it's great that there are privacy and security and authentication uh, mechanisms in place, so we can't make those calls for you, but we make those calls with you to make the process easier for recovering. Again, if you respond quickly, um, write everything down, and uh, it, it puts you on the road to recovery. Becky and Rod, I want to thank you both for sharing your insights with us and helping us understand different ways identity theft happens and then how to deal with it. So I just want to thank you so much for your time today happy to be here. And Rod, it was so good to hear you today, too. Absolutely, Becky. We don't get to talk enough. I know. We have to get together more. We do. And Ask Experian is great. Everyone should go there. <laughs> so uh, before we end, we have the credit check question of the week for you, Rod. And that question is, does a different social security number in my credit report mean I'm a fraud victim? And I got a little ahead of myself earlier, I guess. <laughs> uh, the, the answer is not necessarily. Uh, it, there are one of the things to know is that Experian does not have access to Social Security Administration records. I, you know, there's a perception, I think, sometimes that we go to the, the Social Security Administration and say, "What's Rod's Social Security number?" and they tell us, and it doesn't really work that way. We have a very sophisticated system that identifies the social that's likely to be the correct one based on what's reported to us. But again, we don't have access to those records, so we're going to show all of them. Uh, and if you happen to see you know, a, a transpose, transpose digit, which is what is sort of the most common thing that I come across, you know, your social security number is 1234 and you see 1324, it's probably not an indicator of fraud. It's probably just a transposition somewhere in the system and, and it was reported to us 
incorrectly, but we're going to show that so that you can get it corrected. We can help you identify the source and get it resolved, but by itself may not be an indicator of fraud. Again, it's when you see that combination of things that you should really start to be concerned. Thank you, Rod. I want to remind everybody, if you would like to get links to learn more about Becky and Rod, learn about Protect My ID, Protect My ID blog, and the Ask Experian blog, uh, we're collecting all the different resources and putting it on the eXperian blog, which is, you can go to the URL, is ex.pn slash ID theft, and that will be a, a redirect that will send you over to get all those different resources mentioned today. I also want to let you know that we have this credit chat every single Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern here on Twitter and on YouTube. I want to invite you back. If you go to ex.pn slash credit chat, you'll get a list of all the past chats as well as a list of all the upcoming chats coming up. So I invite you to go to our credit chat page on the Experian blog. Just want to let you know that next week we are going to be having a chat with Jeannie Kelly um, about how to rebuild and raise your credit scores. So make sure you join us next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And also, just to let you know, we always love hearing from our community. So if you have suggestions for topics or guests that you would like featured in our hour-long chat, please tweet us at the Experian US Twitter handle. We would love to hear from you. Also, I want to let you know that we just launched the Credit Chat podcast. So we're taking the audio from these Hangouts and putting them into a podcast. If you'd like to start to subscribe to that, you can go to ex.pn slash SoundCloud and that will bring you over to our podcast page where you can download or stream uh, these episodes. Last, if you're interested in getting these videos autom you know, automatically sent to your YouTube account, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking this big button here. And if you'd like to watch last week's episode with Carl Richards where he talked about smart ways for using money, you can click on that link there which will be active after this Hangout Live Hangout is over. I want to thank everyone for tweeting and talking with us today. We'll talk with you all next week.